Meredith, uh, can, do you have any updates for the village? I don't, Brian. Nothing planned. Okay. And Meredith, if it's cool with you, do you want to do the announcement on the trustees? Sure. I can. Um, it hasn't gone out officially yet, but uh, we've received word that two of our five trustees are planning on stepping down uh, from the board. So we're actually going to be recruiting two new trustees, um, asking people to submit letters of interest by, I believe, the end of June. Um, and I'll have a front porch forum post with all the specifics. And then we'll do interviews at our July meeting in hopes that we'll have people on board by the August meeting. So if you're a village resident and over 18, you are encouraged to submit a letter of interest if you are an interest, interested. And, and who is stepping down? Um, it's uh, Bob Sweetser and Phil Wilson. Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, I think that the bulk of our meeting tonight was planned for our guest speaker. So I will uh, go ahead and take over and take over for Eric and get that switched over. Uh, let's see. So I am muting everyone else. Uh, if you want to ask questions, please uh, raise your hand if you're on the phone. Um, if you're on the phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine. Uh, in person, it's a, a button on your computer uh, or message myself, message to me in chat and I will do my best to call on everybody uh, who asks a question through chat. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Bo Yang of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Uh, she's here to be our guest speaker tonight. So, uh, Bo, you thank can you. go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you all um, for coming here tonight and giving me some of your Friday evening. And, um, but probably most importantly, for just wanting to engage in a discussion truly about what we're seeing across our country and even here in Vermont and then uh, to sort of process what that means for for us um, and so I really wanted to spend the bulk of this time really answering questions and um, having a, a discussion that I hope is respectful and also uh, safe and so I would uh, I would just say that um, no question is a dumb question. I really would encourage you to ask all the questions that you want to ask, and I may or may not be able to answer all of those, but I would be more than happy to do that. Um, I did ask um, Brian and Eric to share the uh, commentary that I wrote for um, for the people of Vermont, and that was published in Vermont Digger and the Montpelier Times Argus. And um, so I just want to sort of start from there and start with sort of my belief that what happened to George Floyd in South Minneapolis wasn't one, wasn't an isolated incident or event. And it wasn't just because of police brutality or a few bad police officers who did not follow protocol, that what we were really seeing is systemic racism and the way that racism shows up in every aspect of our lives. And that happened to be the thing that showed up that was recorded. But in fact, this has been the result of so many things that have happened over so many generations to get us to this point and um, having a discussion about what systemic racism looks like and how it impacts Black Americans differently than other types of racism in society. Because other people experience discrimination as well, there's no doubt about that, but not in the same form that Black Americans do. And I think for the first time, we are really opening our eyes to what it might look like and what it might mean to be 
uh, African American in in this country, and uh, we will never fully understand that. But we can at least, with our hearts, try to comprehend uh, what that pain and what that sorrow looks like. So, um, having said that. I want to open this up to all of you to ask any questions that you might have about what I wrote and anything that um, you'd like to ask. Brian, are you going to manage this? I think I'm back on, right? Yes, you are. Okay. Apologize for that. My, I had to boot my computer and everything. I... Uh, Eric, we're not able to hear you tonight. Uh, I think we had this problem another night and you were able to fix it. So um, let's try now. How's that? Okay, perfect. Great. Sorry. Uh, hey, Bor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm a social studies teacher at our, our local public high school, Lamoille Union High School. And, uh, and of course, as the school year approaches, we want to address these issues of racial injustice in our schools. Um, and, you know, we have unique challenges being where we are and that, you know, the large majority of our students are white and that uh, most of our students have grown up in an environment where uh, their only experiences with people of color are through media, news, film, social media, right? Yeah. And so, and so, you know, I, I want to ask you how, how do we move beyond this this binary like you're a racist, you're not a racist conversation, right? We all have our implicit biases that are built into us from our experiences growing up, and and I and I really encourage students to speak out and air their opinions in my classroom. And they're all in different places on this issue. And I don't want to, um, and I want to encourage everyone to speak out, but that can be very controversial, you know, and difficult in the environment that we're in. And I just, uh, it's, it's a real challenge for me because I, I like to hear what kids have to say and I like to meet them where they are. Um, but that can, that can be really challenging because we're all, we're all on a continuum here of our understanding about these issues, you know, and I, and I, I think there's no one who's right or wrong. There's just people who need education. And I, it's a very, it's a minefield to walk in the classroom. We've been encouraged, of course, to talk about this more in the coming school year, but it's a lot of my colleagues approach it with great trepidation for fear cool. of being uh, uh, called out for being too much this or too much that or, or saying these things. So if you could address that, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Eric, for asking that really, really great question. And you said a, a lot there that I want to address. And the first piece of that is we have a state that is predominantly white. And what does that mean for us in terms of our understanding of um, race? And I, I do want to say that, um, and I think I, I'm I'll point this out that George Floyd was murdered in a very a uh, multiracial and diverse city, a city that I grew up in. And so racism is happening everywhere and it doesn't matter whether you are growing up in a diverse place or in a place that is very white like we are here in Vermont. One of the things that makes us unique though uh, is that in Vermont, when people of color experience racism, people of color here are isolated. And so we really need um, white people to be our allies. We really need white people to be our bystanders and to be the people that say, I'm sorry, I can't believe that that happened. Because in Minneapolis, if growing up as a kid, if someone said to me, go back to your country, I've got 20 other Asian friends who are like, shut up to that individual and I don't feel alone. But in Vermont, if that happens to a kid here and a teacher or an administrator or the other students don't stand up, that discrimination has a, it has a much more, can potentially have a much more detrimental impact because they are also isolated. And so I think that's one of the things that we have to recognize is that there's real power here in in hearing people out and being effective bystanders. And that uh, we, need, we need white people to stand up with us and to stand up uh, along with us and to stand next to us when this kind of stuff is happening. And so 
Uh, one of the things that um, I encourage us to do is how do we how do we learn how to be effective bystanders? And kids can learn that. That's really easy. Kids can learn that because it's really empathy, and we can teach our children empathy. So that let's say you have a child who uses the N word at home, and they come to school and they use that instead of a school saying, "Oh, he didn't know any better. He's only seven, or he's only eight. You have kids and the teacher says, let's talk about why that word is not okay. Let's take the afternoon and talk about where that word comes from and why that's not okay. So that kid, and then let's like, or, um, or imagine a teacher saying to the African American kid who just heard that word and say, I heard that word and that's not okay. And I, I want you to know that I'm not going to ignore it and we're going to address it and uh, maybe we need to read more or something like that. Um, one of the most effective tools for having these discussions, um, Eric, is education. And because we're, we're all in the role of educators in one way or another, but especially you, is that there are so many great books out there that have already done phenomenal jobs of teaching us about what racism looks like. And so we don't necessarily have to do that ourselves. And so I do understand that there is trepidation, but the good news is the work has already been done for us in so many ways. And so uh, I don't know what, what grade level you teach, Eric, but there's a, there's a really great book that would be great for high school students called The Color of Law. And it's all about how our government actually segregated America, even though, that's great, nine, yeah, so even though America had already started to desegregate and to live with each other. Our government actually, through policies and through grants and through loans, actually started to segregate America. And that is a really beautiful like, uh, and informative book to teach students how we got to be segregated, one in Vermont and across the country. And so then we have a discussion based on uh, not people's feelings, but based on facts and a, a thorough and full investigation. A really, so if you're teaching criminal justice or you're teaching about, uh, you know, arrest or law enforcement, um, one really great, one really great ca case that you could talk about is the difference between how we punished crack cocaine and powder cocaine differently, right? And so, and to ask, why did we do that? And, and that's a really great jumping off point about sometimes we have laws in place that technically don't look like they're discriminatory when you just read them, but in fact, they have a discriminatory impact. And what happens when someone is imprisoned for crack cocaine? Well, we take fathers and moms away from their children. Those children end up in DCF uh, without their parents. And then we create generations of stories like that. And what is the toll that that takes on a family when something like that happens? And so and that's a really good example of it. I'm not calling anybody out as an individual racist. That's a system that was in place that has caused us to see the disparities that we have. And it's much harder at, to argue against systems, especially because they're fact-based. So I hope that um, I hope that is helpful. Also, Eric, um, the Human Rights Commission. We just hired our director of policy, education, and outreach, Amanda Garces, and she's also the chair of the Act One Working Group that is starting to discuss what the standards for social equity should look like in Vermont schools. And so we're really lucky to have her at the HRC, and she and I are going to be working on rolling out what implicit bias trainings look like in schools, in a series. And so I, if, if this is something that your school is interested in, I would encourage you to give us a call. And especially if there is trepidation, that we can kind of formulate, how do we talk about implicit bias with kids over the next couple of years? And what does that look like? And what do our books look like if we want to be inclusive? And how do we learn that? Because it's actually, like you could be learning about race and gender identity as well as gender as well as all of these other protected categories 
in music class. We can be learning about it in criminal justice class, in history class. Uh, really, we can embed these social issues in almost every class that we teach. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Boar and Eric. All right, uh, then Beth Foy, you've got your hand up. Uh, okay, go ahead, Beth. Hi, Boar, thank you for joining us. Um, this is a really important topic and I'm appreciative you're making the time. Um, the, one of the things, my, line, my questioning is actually around the same lines as Eric, but, and I think you had touched on most of it. Um, but my question is more the how. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you're working on how to bring these into the school system. Um, it definitely, um, these types of discussions need to be had at a younger level. I have kids in high school and I can tell you my kids have not come home talking about these things, which is concerning. I want my kids to come home and say, wow, like have a shock factor around um, really understanding implicit bias or understanding, you know, what happened to a certain um, race in history or whatever, whatever that wow factor is, because that wow, you know, that emotion is what is going to cause it to stick with them. So my question is, um, I would hope, I hope that um, you're not looking for schools to reach out as much as you are making it mandatory to build some of these things in um, to the school system. Um, I can talk about this at home with my kids, but me talking about it at home with my kids doesn't have an impact on our community as a whole, other than the butterfly effect, <laughs> right? Um, so my questioning for you is, um, are you working with uh, superintendent sorry, supervisory union curriculum directors? Are you working with schools directly? Like what, it, how, how does this look for you? And how quickly is something looking, are you looking to roll something out? Um, at the younger levels, I'm particularly interested in, Eric can have conversations at the high school levels. That's awesome. He's a really good teacher, by the way. And I have no doubt he does a phenomenal job talking about these really hard subjects with the kids. Um, but I'm looking, like my question is more about elementary levels um, and and middle school levels and you know high school a lot of thoughts are already formed um, that can be shifted but I want to get to the you know as thoughts are originating at a younger level how is that being incorporated yeah. so let me just say that I can't make anything mandatory <laughs> only our legislators can and so I do know that there was a bill this year that of course, because of COVID-19 is stalled, um, but there was a bill to make implicit bias trainings mandatory in all schools. Um, and that was mostly for teachers and administrators and staff more so than for students. Um, so that's why I typically do wait for people to come to me. And plus we're an office of six. And we're also doing investigations and litigation, all that other stuff that keeps us really busy too, plus policy. So the education outreach part is an important component, one that I never want to um, abandon or ignore, but it is just a small piece of what we do. Um, but um, at, the, at that age group, I do think that you can have discussions about race um, by, so let me, let me just say that right now we do talk about race, but it's often in the context of history. We talk about race on Martin Luther King Day or in the month of uh, February or Black History Month, or we talk about race uh, in terms of like learning about what slavery was and what the civil rights movement, but we never talk about what race looks like today. Right, And that's the piece that is missing for our kids because they always think growing up that this is something that happened in the past. It is really ugly and bad, but we're all good now. We're all good now and we don't have to talk about it. And, and by, the say, by the way, when I say we don't, um, a lot of children of color are talking about race. It really is white children and other non-black children that are privileged enough that they don't have to talk about it because it doesn't have an impact on them. So if you have children who are black and brown in your schools, they're talking about it. 
the same way a child with a disability is talking about their disability. And a child without a disability, of course, has nothing to talk about, except unless they know someone or has a friend. So, so these discussions are happening in some of the homes because they are happening at schools and elsewhere. Um, but we need to, when we have the discussions about what it looks like in history, it is such a great opportunity to talk about what it looks like now. And how do we have those discussions? It's to educate ourselves about what it looks like now too. To talk about what race disparities looks like in our prison systems right now. To talk about what race disparities look like in our housing system right now and so forth. So I recently did a, uh, I, recent, I forgot what it was called, but it was, uh, uh, I did a presentation for 10 year olds and it was on discrimination and uh it was it was such a wonderful experience because one they were all they were already learning so much but um i i told them what i did and i said do you know that right now believe it or not that there are still some landlords who will not rent to people because they are black did you know that and they were like what now Wait, I thought I thought that was just like during Martin Luther King Day. I didn't know landlords are still in Vermont, right? And so like that's yeah, because that's why we. What is the Human Rights Commission, and why are they still really busy? And what do they do? And that's a really great way to have um, some of those conversations. And the good news is there are places like the Human Rights Commission, plus a whole bunch of other entities who can come in and do that work and help you do that work. And so you're not alone. You don't have to create the curriculum. You don't have to create the standards. Uh, there are so many great entities in Vermont who are doing the equity work at all levels in our schools. And uh, we, can, we can do that together. Um, the other thing I wanna say too, because I, I heard it a couple times about implicit bias is that um, there, there's this great book called uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And it suggests that if you are not actively working against racism, that you are racist. And um, I, I, I don't teach that typically in Vermont, only because uh, it makes people so uncomfortable. And in the state of Vermont, where there are so many people living in poverty who are white. It is really hard to understand what privilege looks like, that how can you be privileged if you have been abused or if you have been poor and all of that stuff. And how can you be a racist if you also have been discriminated against and you're not consciously aware of that and so forth. Um, but I do wanna say that we, we have an obligation to our community to recognize that if we are called racist, maybe that, like, who cares? So like, like if the conversation never stops in terms of are you a racist or are you not, the reality is who cares because there's still work to be done. Let's not be so fragile that we can't even hear that term uh, before we do the work. We can still do the work on how to combat what racism looks like systemically, in, and introspectively and, and otherwise. And then um, how to help our kids be anti-racist, right? So one of the, um, going back to also something you had mentioned, Eric, is like one of the things that they did at Montpelier High School is they wrote a letter, the, those kids got together and also wrote a statement, a statement that said that they also support Black Lives Matter, or that they that they are that they want to make demands too, and that's a really great way to get kids active in in uh, the social issues. Is to go, what are the problems that you see, and who is responsible for answering to you? And I think they wrote the, that letter to the governor, and and um, and I think that's really beautiful to say, yeah, we are. 10th graders, but we see it, we know it, here's the problem, and here's the demands we want to make. Um, and for teachers to help the kids even draft it, whether you agree with it or not, is a really beautiful, beautiful thing. Thank you, Beth, and four. Uh, all right, 
Kate, I've got you up next. Okay, Kate, go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Great. Um, first, Bor, thank you so much for being here. I so appreciated your editorial. I feel like it was sort of a model statement in many ways. I think there are a lot of people making public statements right now um, that can can be somewhat hollow. Um, and I just really appreciated that yours um, included very specific uh, policy statements and commitments. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just quickly speak to some of the things that are coming up because they've related to schools. Um, I sit on the steering committee of the Racial Equity Alliance of Lamoille, which uh, is about two years old now. And we have a few working groups. One of them is the Real Schools Group, which I co-chair. Um, and we've spent the last year working really hard to uh, w build a youth coalition in addition to our coalition and to um, try to get the local supervisor unions to the table. And we um, have a really fantastic partner in Kat Gallagher, uh, who I know came up in the comments. She's the superintendent in Lamoille North. Um, and and some of what is being talked about, um, we are working on implementing within Lamoille North. I think Lamoille South will be coming to the table later this summer. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that, you know, here or anywhere else. I can put Reel's email address in the comments if local folks want to be in touch about what that can look like um, or if they have youth that want to be involved. But one of the things that I just wanted to mention um, is that we've sort of become a, a, uh, a place that people reach out to. And we've received a number of, of correspondence from teachers asking various kinds of questions. Um, for example, a teacher who wrote us anonymously um, because a student of theirs had submitted assignment, an assignment that they believed, uh, the, the teacher believed uh, included racist content. And this teacher wanted support around how to address this. And, and the thing I wanna comment on is that this teacher, and I would say it's almost been universal with every staff member who's reached out to us, they wanted to remain anonymous. They have not wanted us to even know the school district that they work in. They've sent emails through friends or family so that they're not identified. And I, I feel like that in and of itself is such a heavy commentary on the, the at least the way that people perceive um, how they will be viewed if they speak openly against racism in our local community and in our local schools. Um, and I think as people have said already, it puts, in my mind, I really think we need top-down leadership on this to create safe spaces for the teachers uh, and, and very clear guidance and education for the teachers on how to have these conversations and to be very clear that administration 100% has their back because currently the sense is teachers don't feel safe having these conversations in their classroom. Thank you for sharing that, Kate. Um, that is uh, sad and also yet not surprising. And I do think that we, we're seeing that across the state as well is sort of this fear of speaking up or how to how to address that and some of that goes back to there is such a fear of being called a racist that then it becomes impossible to have a conversation about race right so if you have administrators that are so fearful of the of being called out as racist that there's that then you have teachers who are like i want to address this issue and i can't do it um straight in a straightforward manner um and honestly and transparently because i'm so afraid that your like sensitivity to being called a racist won't actually allow me to even have this conversation or that there would be retribution or and so forth and that the only way to address that is 
half up or ground up, right? It's al it's almost like you need to have leaders who do say that we will protect everyone. We need to have these conversations. Here's how we do it. Um, and we need to learn together. Um, or you're going to have students um, who are going to, on the ground up, say, this is happening and, and none of you are addressing it. And then it really becomes very problematic, uh, almost like, like a grassroots movement. And then it, it, it will blow up and that has happened and it does happen. And so I don't think that ignoring it um, is not safe. And I do think that that's very telling. So when teachers are afraid to address that, I think that says a lot. Um, and I think it, it requires that our leaders do say you are protected uh, and we need to learn together. But thank you for sharing that, Kate. All right, thank you, Kate. Or next up, I've got uh, Casey Romero. Okay, go ahead, Casey. Thank you. Question about statistics. Does you, do you have statistics on inequities in wages, job opportunities, and so forth? Uh, we're, folks are working on a countywide grant that's addressed, that addresses uh, making better transitions to better jobs or jobs at all for certain groups some disadvantaged and you know we want to address race gaps as well do are you is your commission a source of statistics and facts on that or would that be department of labor um that probably is the department of labor and part of the issue is making sure that they are collecting it right so part of the big discussion recently is that the department of health needs to start collecting data around race because we need to know what impact that is having on uh, people of color, uh, people in LGBTQ communities, people with disabilities. We need to, to see what that looks like. And so part of it is pushing uh, departments to collect it. But the HRC itself doesn't collect those types of data. Okay. Uh, we okay. primarily handle uh, individual cases and we do have we, I mean, obviously, a lot of those statistics are available to us, but they typically have been collected and analyzed through some other entity. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up, I've got Tommy Gardner. Okay, go ahead, Tommy. Y'all can hear me. Yes. Okay. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. is uh, really interesting, and it's uh, and it's uh, very timely. I sat in a very. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, very interesting uh, junior high advisory last week and uh, man uh, a, a lot of adults out there in social media land could learn a lot from some of these uh, sixth seventh and eighth graders um, my question though is um the uh, the Senate government operations uh, committee yesterday began discussions of uh, police reform and there's a draft memo out there uh, with basically all the various factions of uh, law enforcement and the memo covers hiring training body cameras, community relations, and explicit and implicit bias, and, um, uh, and a push for more transparency and uh, into misconduct allegations. Uh, that last one in particular is something that we in the media are, are, are very interested in. Um, but I'm just wondering what role, if any, the, the, the HRC plays or would play in kind of updating the police handbook um, now, that the, now that it seems that there's a groundswell of, of, a, of, of willingness to actually um, to look at themselves. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that they want the HRC to come anywhere near that um, handbook. So I, unless the legislature um, put, uh, puts that duty within our statute and our jurisdiction, then we don't necessarily have a role in doing that. Part of my role and Amanda's role, uh, who I mentioned earlier is our Director of Policy Education and Outreach, is to testify on bills uh, pretty regularly, bill in support of bills that we think are helpful and um, against bills that we think are actually going to be harmful to different groups of people in Vermont, specifically Vermont's most vulnerable. So this morning I testified on S219 in um, Senate Judiciary on uh, use of force 
and changing the standard of use of force from reasonable to necessary so that um, police only use force if it is necessary. And that means that it would require them to think about alternatives before they jump to force. Now, here's the reality is that we have so underfunded all of the entities that address mental health issues and homelessness and poverty and substance use and abuse. And we have entirely relied on the police to deal with that. We have not only are the police doing criminal investigations, but they're dealing with all of those issues. And uh, they're ill-equipped. They don't know how to deal with mental health issues. They don't know how to respond to someone with a, uh, who's making threatening phone calls who, have a, who has a psychiatric disability. They don't have social workers available all the time. Some of them do, but they're not available all the time. So when they show up, they're treating this person with a psychiatric disability as a criminal. Their job is to go there and arrest them. So they don't necessarily know how to de-escalate when they're facing someone with a psychiatric disability. And likewise, when you look at the murder of George Floyd, he was accused of using a $20 counterfeit bill, $20. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've paid speeding tickets way more that multiple times that. And so that to me is an example of why are we even arresting people or calling the police on people for using a $20? That's a crime of poverty. That should not even be a crime. Why is the police the right people to respond to something like that? Right? When someone comes in and uses a $20 counterfeit bill, I think the, we should be calling a social worker on, hey, how do we help you? How do we help right. you yeah. get what you need? Not the police to come out there and arrest someone for, for that. And, um, so I think we need, we have an opportunity here to really reevaluate what are we using the police for and should we be using them for that? And where can we divert some of that money to to really help people in our communities so that uh, people who are poor, people who are homeless, people with mental illness are not ending up in our prisons, in our jails, because that is actually what is happening. The amount of, of people with mental health issues in our jails and prison is alarming. Right. It is alarming. And that's because we have just completely criminalized, criminalized that. But I am aware that government ops and Senate is taking a lot of that testimony. It is not specific to a, any bills yet. I know that they are interested in it. So I am following it very closely. Um, the legislative session is going to end soon. And I'm really hoping that we can really push some of these bills that are really important um, now. And what can we do as a community is pay attention to the bills that are happening right now and to call our legislators and not just the ones that represent us here in Johnson, right? But all of them in those committees and say, this is an important bill, pass it, please. <laughs> and I think that's, the, that's really, really important. Um, and that's something our kids can do too, is that our kids can follow legislation and our kids can say, I really love this piece of legislation and I want it passed. And who do I write to to make that happen? That would be beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. All right. Uh, Elizabeth Perry, I've got you up next. Okay, Elizabeth, go ahead. Hello, and thank you um, for sharing your time with us here in Johnson. I wanted to speak to the issue of um, your comment that uh, it, uh, if you're not fighting racism, you are a racist. And I think that, uh, you know, Governor Scott, in one of his press conferences not too long ago said, it's not enough to not be a racist. We must be anti-racist. And I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I never considered myself a racist. However, I do recognize that um, 
in my travels these last 67 years, there's a good chance that I have hurt people along the way. I mean, I can think of specific instances in my ignorance. So what I think we all should do as white people is examine our own privilege and how that how our history got us where we are. I mean, I certainly know how my history got me where I am. I'm comfortable, I'm retired, I own my home, I had a stable upbringing, my parents expected me to do well in school, they supported me, they bought me books, I had never went to bed hungry, I had a college education twice. I have a master's degree. I have all sorts of privilege. Now, I have that, and I'm comfortable being uncomfortable addressing my own privilege. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to offend anyone who is feeling downtrodden or um, offended if we say, oh, look at you, you're a racist. I don't think we should do that, but I think those of us who can afford some own our own self-examination look at where we are and why we're here and then work toward bringing everyone else up and not accusing people of racism but we should work toward anti-racism Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I, I just want to be clear that I cannot take any credit for what it's from an author that wrote the book about how to be an anti-racist. And, um, <clears throat> and I think that the more we think about that, it really is just a calling on all of us to do more, right? To say that let's stop having this, this fear of being called a racist and let's just accept Maybe we are, and how do we now fight against that? Okay. So if, if, yeah, so if we want to move the conversation from a binary, like, are you a racist, or are you not? Let's just say, okay, we are. Now how do we become anti-racist? Now how do we address that? And I think that's really important. And I also have a, uh, uh, it's not an example so much as um, something that I said this morning during my testimony in Senate Judiciary was that, the reason why Mr. Floyd, uh, Mr. George Floyd's uh, murder was so compelling to so many Americans um, was that we were dealing with a 20, an allegedly use of a $20 counterfeit bill. We have a video that shows he didn't resist. He didn't have any firearms on him. Um, and they were, the police here were using a force that was not, uh, didn't follow protocol and he was begging for his life, and so were a lot of other people begging for his life to be spared, and it was all caught on video, and then he died right in front of everyone. But I want us to remember that there are so many instances like that, going back generations of black people being killed by law enforcement and white people, and in each of those times, us as non-black people, might have seen it and said to ourselves or to each other something like this well he shouldn't have resisted or why was his hands in his pocket when the police told him to take it out or maybe he shouldn't have robbed that grocery store then so we were already vilifying and criminalizing someone who was never charged or convicted of a crime and it is those discussions that maybe is the point of saying that if we don't do anything, that we are racist. If we are not actively fighting against racism, then we are potentially racist because we're choosing to ignore it. And we're choosing to excuse what has been happening for generations. And now we are only now in many ways opening our eyes to it um, in this instance. Uh, think about all the numbers of deaths that probably occurred that were never recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Shane, I've got you up next. 
Okay, Shane, go ahead. Hi, Bor. Thank you for uh, being here. And I, I appreciate every, a lot of what you've had to say tonight. Um, one thing in particular that uh, you answered a few questions ago, uh, talking a, a little bit about some of the ways in which we criminalize poverty. And I think, you know, I, I realized the other night when I was, I was watching a movie that in, in many ways, some of that is just kind of collateral damage that we white people are facing from institutional racism. And I think that's an important piece of that conversation. Um, but I, I do think that is a part of it that, that impacts everybody and might be something that we're all able to come together around and, and solve some of those things. So could you talk about some of the ways in which we you know, criminalize poverty and, and mental health issues and substance abuse issues um, that has an impact on everybody? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, uh, the $20 counterfeit bill is a really great example of that. But in Vermont, we also set, we have like cash, ba cash bail. Um, so that like certain people can afford to be free, other people cannot if they are arrested. Um, also, the, the fact that we suspend our children, our children who are black and brown two to three times more than white children in our schools. And then we, we expel them and then we defer them to the police. Using the law enforcement in our school system is an example of how uh, we are using law enforcement to address social, social issues and not even recognizing that we have already started to criminalize like, poverty, right? um by by doing that um there's so many great examples i i, I want to come back to that question shane because i almost wish i had the criminal statutes in front of me because there are many there actually are many um and like minor there there were um there were so many minor offenses that we were criminalizing people for instead of giving them help only now actually are we starting to see diversion programs. But in the, maybe just even a decade ago, if you were an addict and you were stealing, we were sending you to, to jail or to prison. Now we're starting to go, wait a minute, that's not helping. And maybe we need to divert that. Maybe we need to give people help when they're addicts, not imprison them. Because what does our, our jail system or our prison system do, do anyway? Um, and we're starting to see sort of like mental health diversion programs too. And I think that's great, um, but it's gonna take a lot. I'm sorry that wasn't the, the probably the, the best answer to you. A really great question, Shane. I, I appreciate it. You did answer, there are, there are a lot of different ways. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Eric Hutchins again. Yeah, I'm here, and I think I know how to make my mic work now. Thank you. Um, so I just want to follow up on a couple of things that were said earlier. One, I want to really thank Kate Donnelly for pointing out the issue around uh, teachers being able to be brave about talking about issues of race in their classrooms. Um, is it's 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 tough um, to do because if you talk about controversial issues in the classroom, you can be you can you can make missteps and that can lead to phone calls and and being called out in ways where it's it's i think a lot of teachers get the message it's just easier not to talk about this stuff than to talk about it because there could be repercussions for bringing up these issues so getting protection for teachers uh from policies from the state or the boards or the nea would be really really useful um because teachers want to be brave and they want to talk about these things but they get they get held back by the potential blowback um, but the other thing is 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 like I you know I, I where we're at in our community I think you have a lot of decision makers and a lot of policy makers and a lot of teachers who are really bought into the idea of of teaching about racial justice and we have the resources and we want to do the right thing and we might be clumsy and not adept at it yet but the, but the but the real friction comes where we're we're meeting community members you know who are not all in favor of this, right? Like that's that's the real challenge, I think, is like we want to be inclusive of everybody and we want to hear whatever it's to say and we have want to have big, good, tough conversations. But we have, you know, like for instance, Black Lives Matter is an organization that personally, based on my reading of history and what's going on in the current climate, and you talk about talking about 
racism, not in a historical context, but in a current context, that's a group that addresses that. And if I advocate for that organization, or I say that their principles are based on justice and truth, I'm taking a political standpoint that puts me in a position in my school where I am going to run up against students, parents, community members, perhaps board members, other colleagues who think that that's a political stand that is contrary to their reading of truth in history. And that, that's where we're really the, the friction is, I think, in our community, is that there's a lot of people who feel that doing the right thing is going to uh, create a, a friction that we're not prepared to deal with. And if you could address that. And, and I really appreciate so many of your comments. It's, this conversation has been super helpful and, and great for our community. Thank you for coming. Thank, well, thank you again for, for sharing that. And uh, I mean, friction is how change happens. Friction is the only way sometimes change happens. And so um, I'm a big believer that we have to do the right thing regardless. We have to be bold enough uh, to do it regardless of that friction. Um, and so the, um, oftentimes we are so afraid of friction. We are so afraid of it. And so we don't want to stand up against it. That's why like, we can't even be effective bystanders because we'll hear something offensive. We don't even know what to say or we're so afraid of that friction in that one tiny, teeny, tiny conversation that we, we ignore it instead. And, and uh, then we have abandoned our principles in that moment because, because of fear of friction. Um, and I, I just am a firm believer that we are constantly in a state of friction if we're actually gonna bring about change and to be okay with that. Um, uh, I, I know that I have heard from some of you about like, what happens when your neighbors fly a Confederate flag and the friction that is involved in should we make them take that down and what are their constitutional rights and what are our rights as a neighbor and don't we want to be welcoming to everybody and what does that flag mean and so forth but what's interesting is if you look at that situation if someone was flying a flag uh with a naked woman on it you bet all of you would be like no we have kids here or if it said c-u-n-t you bet you would be out there going about your first amendment rights that is not okay but for some reason we seem to be nervous about race and the discussion of race and so when we're talking about Confederate flags or Black Lives Matter flags, all of a sudden that friction feels really uncomfortable. And I think sometimes that friction comes from within us, um, about us being able to feel comfortable having that conversation uh, because, uh, and, and to recognize that and to say, why do I feel so uncomfortable? Like, why do I have to be anonymous? when I want to talk to my administrators about this. Why does this make me so nervous? Is it them? Is it me sometimes? What is going on here? And I, I think that's really important uh, to address and, and to say. Thank you. Uh, next up, I've got uh, Kate Donnelly. Okay, Kate, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Um, I just want to add to that, um, because I know a lot of people are looking into to reading different books right now, and unfortunately, they're all sold out, which is also very fortunate. But one of the books that is um, a really, I think, a really um, valuable book for folks to look into um, is for white folks specifically to look into is White Fragility. And one of the concepts that Robin DiAngelo introduces in a lot of the book is talking about whiteness, the construct of whiteness and white identity, and that it's sort of equally as important, if not more, that we be talking about white supremacy as much as we're talking about racism. And she introduces this idea of white solidarity, and essentially this idea that like, white folks are socialized to learn that they will be more punished for speaking out against racism than for um, essentially maintaining white solidarity. 
So we are socialized to believe that when we're in the cafeteria and our friend says something that's racist, that we're more at risk of holding that friend accountable than we are of um, just laughing along or turning our head in the other direction. And so I think while these conversations are so difficult to have, and I absolutely believe it's why we need help from the top down, I think it's also helpful for white folks to keep in mind that the part of the reason it's so hard is because we're socialized for it to be hard. And it's part of what keeps the structures in place in the way that they are. And so I think that's part of our work to do, white folks in our community, is to really come together and have each other's back around these discussions and find ways to be brave and then support one another as we are pushing against something that's really quite intense and, and that does put people at very real risk. Hey, Brian, uh, we're coming up on the top of the hour. So why don't we take one more question and we'll move on. Okay. All right, thank you, Kate. Uh, James, I've got you up next. Okay, go ahead, James. All right, um, there's been so much going on in my mind that I guess I will kind of, I guess, thinking about what Eric said in his, um, about being afraid to speak on topics because of backlash from community members, really scared of that I know something Day. And I guess as a teacher in an alternative school, I'm just wondering, you know what I mean? How do we make the most of curriculum? You know what I mean? When we have these conversations in the moment, like what are we identifying? You know, like I guess I know I'm a little rambly, but I guess one example that I can have is um, the All Lives Matter conversation. Why I personally view it as you know what I mean? While it, I get where people might be coming from, I also tend to view it as a form of racism because nobody, I, I look at statistics of police shootings in 2017, and it really stuck out to me that in 2017, twice as many white people were actually killed by the cops as black people. And you really don't hear that blown up in the media, but as soon as um, black people were speaking from a historic perspective, historic perspective with a history of violence with the cops as soon as we start speaking out well it's all lives matter you know what i mean so it's almost used as you know what i mean not almost it's just a disparaging term so i mean i guess how do we what's the best way we can like explain that and push that conversation forward yeah thank you thank you james for sharing for sharing that um i do want to address that all lives matter comment because um and and I, I hope that this is hopeful a hopeful tool that you can take with you to share with others who say all lives matter so of course all lives matter of course no one has ever questioned that all lives matter that is an obvious that is why you don't have to say it because it is obvious the black lives matter movement has always been that black lives matter as well, as well too, T-O-O. And so when you honor black lives matter, what you're saying is you matter too. And so we don't have to respond in a hurtful manner by saying all lives matter. A really good example of this is if your friend says to you, my, um, my dad died this week. And you said, all dads die eventually. That's true, but that's unnecessary and it's hurtful. Or, um, you know, I, I, a little kid says, I, I, I was really hungry. Um, and our response to that is, yeah, we don't get hungry. And yes, that's true, but that is very hurtful. So just because it is the truth that all lives matter, doesn't mean that, that it isn't a hurtful statement. It is an incredibly hurtful statement and it dishonors 
the movement that is Black Lives Matter. And that's why we don't say that. And that's why we don't post that and we don't honor that because we already know that that's true. We never have to question that all lives matter. This is a movement about respecting Black lives and recognizing that Black lives matter as well. And there is zero reason why we wouldn't respect that, truly. Thank you. Yeah, it's as a person of color, it's like one of the hardest conversations I have because it's, it's you know, it's obvious, you know, that like all lives matter. It's something that should go without saying. You know what I mean? I've been giving comments like, well, why don't you change it to Black Lives Matter too? But for me, and I went to a training on racial trauma, something that stuck out from a guy named Ken Hardy actually was that when you think about the history of Black people and white people in this country, Black people were brought over here as slaves to make the life of the white person easier. So it, it just kind of, sometimes it just rubs me the wrong way when you hear, oh, well, why don't you say it this way? Why should I have to protest in ways that make you comfortable on which you will never really say this? You know what I mean? And I'm not saying this is, you know what I mean? I, I'm far from prejudiced against anybody. This is just me speaking out, so I don't want anybody to think anything like that. But um, yeah, those are just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, Brian, do we have a, do we, is that the end of our story? I, I mean, our question? Uh, that's the last question. Okay. I want to um, end, if that's okay, Brian, with a, um, a quick story that I shared the other day. And uh, one of the things that we come up against a lot in Vermont when we talk about race is the fact that so many white Vermonters live in poverty. And it is really hard when you are experiencing that kind of hardship to recognize that you can be privileged in any way. Um, but nevertheless, it is there. And I wanna share sort of my story. So I grew up in South Minneapolis and I did grow up very poor and I also have a disability. I was also an immigrant and a woman and I grew up in a very diverse place. I've always considered myself someone who was very awake to social equity issues. And, uh, and probably never having seen myself as privileged in any way. And I took a trip to Southeast Asia. And um, so I'm Hmong, H-M-O-N-G, and my people don't have a country of their own. They come from different groups. Uh, there are different groups who have lived in different countries. So a couple years ago, I took this trip to Southeast Asia, and I was traveling and, and going to visit the villages of my people in each of these countries in Thailand, in Laos, and in Vietnam. And in each of those places, I found that my people were the poorest. They were all farmers. And in those countries, you're, you only have money if you are a business savvy or educated. But if you are a farmer, you are really poor. And people have, uh, in those countries, developed a lot of discrimination against my, my people. And so people, the Hmong were, had been, um, in, a, in order to assimilate, had changed their names so that they could pass in each of those countries. And while we were walking through the streets of this beautiful village in Vietnam, me, my sisters and nephews, uh, this dog who was, uh, had just been in a fight and was on a leash and we didn't see it, literally lunged out of nowhere and attacked my nephew. And it was really a very scary moment. And I remember saying to our tour guide, who was Hmong at the time, and I said, you need to call the police. We need to address this. This is really scary. We don't know what to do. And she said to me, you can't call the police. You can't police because they won't believe you because you're Hmong and they won't take your uh, side. And I remember in that moment going, this is how black people feel in America. And I have always considered myself someone who's very awake to that and in theory understanding that. But until that moment, I realized I'm also a very privileged person. As an Asian American, especially in Vermont, I never get stopped by the police. I never hesitate to call the police. Um, 
and to wake up to that reality. So sometimes when we have experienced hardships ourselves, it is that much harder to recognize what our privileges are. And I share that with you because I think it's important to, to realize and to, to, to know that just because we have hardships, it doesn't take away from the fact that other people do too and that we need to know that. And especially in America, Black Americans are still uh, the most discriminated group and they have the most complicated and hard history that has resulted in what we are seeing today. And um, I just would encourage all of us to learn more because you don't need to have an experience like mine to wake up to privilege. You, in fact, just have to read. You just have to read and learn more about that. I want to thank you all so much for inviting me back. You are an incredibly group of people, a group of people who are working hard to learn more and to process all of this. And um, so it's just so really grateful tonight to be here. Thank you for coming, Bor. <laughs> OK, thank you, Bor, for coming. I really appreciate it. I apologize I was not able to uh, officially introduce you and welcome you to Johnson, back to Johnson, Johnson, I should say. You were here in January, I believe, and gave yeah. a, a talk. Uh, I think the timing was very uh, uh, good for you to come back and have this talk. It's a very important subject. And I do really appreciate you uh, taking your time out tonight and coming back to us. I would like to go back to a couple of announcements that I wasn't able to provide. Uh, one of them is there is going to be an upgrade coming to the municipal office that, uh, for the Wi-Fi, so the wireless folks that are having to uh, sit in our park parking lot and do their school work and their work from home and that sort of thing, it should be a, a better connection. That is coming. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a speaker we had was T.J. Donovan, and a lot of people talked to the issues they were having with a certain member of the community who was doing a lot of uh, mischief, breaking and entering and stealing and that sort of thing. For those of you who may have read the paper, uh, the individual is now in custody and being held and is not able to meet the requirements for release. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out and congratulate the Johnson Food Shelf for a well-deserved, as you know, they uh, have been working overtime and helping the community. It's a real need right now. And they were grant, they received a grant from the Vermont Electric Co-op's Community Fund. So congratulations to them, well-deserving. I did also want to make mention of, of in the paper this week, Dave Banning, had some very, very kind words to say about these Zoom broadcasts. I want everyone to know that uh, I may be the face of it, but that doesn't mean that I'm the only one behind it. Uh, there's a lot of people that make this happen. There's the, the whole emergency management team that was put together when this COVID-19 epidemic started, as well as the leadership from the select board and the trustees have really made this possible. I hope everyone has found it been useful and interesting and and uh, timely with what we've had for topic matters but all good things do come to an end and i do want to announce that we will have one more weekly broadcast it will not be on friday night it will be the following tuesday which is the 23rd and we thought it was would be very appropriate and we're very fortunate to have the governor be in our speaker for that time. So Tuesday the 23rd, the governor will be our Zoom featured speaker. But like I said, I hope everyone's found this useful and uh, been worth their while. I, Gordy told me he did not have any village announcements, but if Meredith's on or Gordy and wanted to say anything. Uh, we did have the village up okay. already this morning. Per perfect. Uh, just to recap a couple of things from the governor's new conference. As some may or may not know, there was the COVID-19 stimulus money to the tune of 1.25 billion that came into Vermont. Phase one of that was about 310 million. 
And right now, unfortunately, it's hung up between the legislature and the governor on how to spend it. It's when mom and dad are fighting, it's never good for the kids. So that's where we are, I guess. Today, he did announce phase two, which is about 90 million with the focus on long-term recovery and something of interest to a lot of people in Johnson as part of that is a, some money is dedicated to broadband expansion. In Vermont, there's about 23% insufficient coverage across the state for Vermonters that cannot get on the internet. And that pretty much is in line with Johnson as well. So that money being dedicated to that is probably not bad for us. It's good for us and for a lot of the rest of the state. I would also mention uh, there is a uh, CUD bill, community, what is it? Communication Union District. Union District, that's right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> that is fast moving through the legislature and it would allow for the uh, legislative body to approve joining it. And there's a few communities in the county that are planning to do that. So uh, looking forward to that. Hopefully it does go through and hopefully the governor does sign it. Uh, I do want to just uh, men make mention again that uh, thank you, Bo Yang, for being our featured speaker this week. And with that, that's all I've got, unless anybody had any questions of what I've announced. Otherwise, we would go over to Lisa Cruz from the Rec Committee. Okay, Lisa. Okay, there you go, Lisa. Happy Friday. Um, just wanted to announce tomorrow is free fishing day for the state, so no license required. Anyone who wants can go out and spend the day fishing. Um, Tonight's music, I am so excited. We have a local student, um, Lydia LaHoulier, will be singing to us. She is an eighth grader at the Lamoille Union, and she has agreed to perform this evening's music. So thank you, Lydia, and take it away. There is a swirling storm, and I'm caught up in the middle of it all. And it's hard control of the person that I thought I was, the girl I used to know. And there is a light in the dark, and I feel its warmth in my head, in my heart. Why can't I hold on? It comes and goes in waves. It always does, it always does. We watch as our young hearts fade into the flood, into the flood. Freedom falling, the feelings we thought were set in stone slips through our fingers, trying hard to let go. It comes and goes in waves. It comes and goes in waves and carries us away. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Lydia. Was it just one? Or were you going to give us an encore? Okay, just one. Okay. okay. With that, uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll, like I say, we will not see you next Friday. It'll be the following Tuesday, the 23rd at 5 p.m., but you'll get notices sent out. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>